Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Sisser and I'm the Executive Director of the Hancock Historical Museum in Findlay, Ohio. And our museum, like so many um, arts and heritage organizations in Ohio and throughout the country, throughout the world, has recently had to close its doors um, because of the coronavirus pandemic. And so my staff and I have been thinking a lot about ways that we can translate some of our programming into digital formats so that we can continue to share uh, our story, our local story with an audience. And so we don't get um, too far away from our mission in this, in this very uncertain time. Um, it's not perfect because we really value the interaction that we get when we do our programming. Um, we really pride ourselves on having intergenerational programming and programming that is very relevant. And so um, we're going to miss some of that interaction, but hopefully we can still get some dialogue going in the comments and things like that. So I thought I'd start by uh, doing a presentation that I had given to an audience at the Bourbon Affair, a local bourbon bar, several weeks ago. And it was uh, really well received then. Of course, people were drinking a lot of bourbon all night long. And so I would strongly suggest that you have a drink. Uh, as you are listening, and then this will all sound great, and I'll be super interesting. Um, but I'm going to talk about the year 1920 and what that looked like in our country, and more specifically, what it looked like in our community in Findlay, Ohio. And originally, I was asked to speak about the 100th anniversary of Prohibition, which is was it's this year. And um, the more research I did, and the more I started to put together this presentation, I realized just what a watershed year 1920 really was throughout the country and, and in our community. And it's the 100th anniversary this year of many um, transformative things. And so I'm going to talk about each one of those. And I'm going to make the assumption that nobody listening to this lived through the year 1920. Um, although I have had the unique um, pleasure of speaking with several people that did live through 1920. Um, I've sort of made it my personal mission over the last few years to gather as many oral histories from people uh, 100 years and older as I can. And so um, I've had some great interviews um, with local folks over 100 years old. Um, and it's just, you know, I, I find that so interesting. They have so much to share, so many incredible stories, just a wealth of knowledge. But 1920 was the dawn of a decade that was loose and roaring, as uh, we know it now, the Roaring Twenties. Of course, leading up to 1920, there was great uncertainty in the world and in our country um, with World War I. Um, but this was a decade that began with a roar and it ended with a crash. And it ushered in this time of incredible prosperity um, and really almost unfathomable change in our country in just about every aspect of life. Um, this picture is not particularly notable, um, except that right now we sure wish our supermarkets looked like this. When I was at the supermarket yesterday, there was nothing on any of the shelves uh, that I needed. But this picture is notable um, and representative of the 1920s because prior to 1920, stores didn't look like this. Um, there was this explosion of consumerism in our country in the 1920s, like our nation and the world had really never seen before. The nation's wealth actually doubled during the decade. Um, so we suddenly had expendable income and money to buy things. And it was this dawn of mass culture. People wanted to buy the same things, um, wear the same things, uh, look the same way. Um, and those trends really were shared broadly for the first time. So World War I had left Europe on the decline, but it really left America on an upward trajectory. And American culture was being created quickly, and it was also being exported. So there were two major events really in the year 1920 that ushered in the decade and changed uh, life in this country forever. Um, the first being the passage of the 19th Amendment, 
and the second being that the first commercial, commercially licensed radio broadcast was heard. So the passage of the 19th Amendment, when women were given the right to vote, they voted differently uh, than men, and they voted um, really in support of their children and in support of their neighborhoods using their life experiences, which were vastly different than their male counterparts, uh, to dictate their choices. Um, so women voting significantly changed uh, our world. And also radio. Here are a couple photos of radio um, being shared uh, in households. It became a way for people to gather socially, and it dispersed all of this American culture that was being so rapidly um, produced very quickly. So if you think about it, in this decade, in the 1920s, people were owning cars, radios, and telephones for the very first time. Here are a couple of pictures of, of cars in the early 1920s. And just think about how much each one of those inventions have changed society, how much they've changed your life. Uh, it changed the physical landscape of our country. It changed how we relate to family and strangers. It brought on the spread of mass culture. And it really changed the size of the world. You know, in the last few days, um, with how quickly things have been changing with the coronavirus, I've been thinking about how quickly the size of the world has changed for us. And literally, um, all of our worlds got much smaller very quickly. We're all sitting inside of our homes. But the size of the world changed because everything was so easily accessible. It was really the start, the very early start of a global society. And especially when you think about the fact that there were great advances in aviation on the horizon, you know, transportation, um, this was the dawn of an incredible decade in transportation. And I love this photo on, uh, in the upper right. You know, think about how the infrastructure in our community here in Finley and throughout the country really wasn't ready for cars. And I imagine this was probably a common sight, um, you know, early on uh, when cars became popular and just weren't ready for the explosion and popularity. So also in 1920, the 18th Amendment passed, which abolished the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol. And this is when we can all boo. Um, but that was just one uh, critical moment in the year. So in short, it was a decade of learning and a decade of a lot of growth, um, really a decade about pushing boundaries. And of course, that meant that there were plenty of examples of people pushing back against that change. There always are people that push back against change. And so in that way, you know, it's not too much different than some of the political conversations that we have today. In fact, some of the things that are happening around immigration, some of the conversations happening around immigration are very similar to those that happened in 1920. Um, conversations about alcohol, uh, you might uh, be able to compare to conversations about the legalization of marijuana in this country. Um, also conversations about the rural-urban divide, which is, I think, top of mind in this country today. Very similar to 1920, because for the first time in American history, you had more people that were living in cities than on farms. So really uh, rapidly changing dynamic. So we'll start out um, here by looking at the context surrounding the 1920s and what the nation looked like, and then we'll look more specifically um, at Finley. So 1920 began with some of the very last American troops returning home from Europe after uh, World War I. Clearly, that experience um, changed those young men that were returning home. It changed uh, the families that had been left here to um, care for uh, the home front. And it changed the way that these soldiers, you know, when they were coming back, saw the world. I think, you know, it caused them to question their own mortality. Uh, it changed the way that they wanted what they wanted out of life. And it also changed the way that they bought things. Um, and sort of the idea of the American dream. And of course, there's a lot of conversation about how that same thing happened, you know, upon return uh, of soldiers in World War II. In 1920, the average lifespan was about 54, and today it's about 77. Uh, the average time that a student spent in school each year was about 75 days, and today it's around 180, although of course, that has been cut short dramatically for our kids here in Ohio and many uh, school children throughout the country um, just here recently. But 
you can see just by those statistics how very different life was, how it was framed very differently. A couple of interesting things, interesting facts about 1920. Babe Ruth began playing for the Yankees that year, and he hit his 50th career home run. This is a young Babe Ruth. Uh, on June 13th of 1920, sending babies through the U.S. Postal Service became illegal. Rather interesting. Uh, a loaf of bread cost 12 cents. A Model T cost $260. And an RCA radio cost $495. The average salary in 1920 was about $3,300. At the beginning of the decade in 1920, cars were really considered um, affordable luxuries, but by the end of the 1920s, they were pretty much a necessity. And of course, vehicles, cars, they changed the economy. There was actually an entire economy that grew up out of uh, cars. So if you think about service stations and motels, none of those things existed prior to to motel, or excuse me, to the vehicles um, that became so widely popular. So they really changed the landscape of the nation. They gave us new freedoms to go where we wanted, when we wanted. And that in turn had a huge ramification in terms of what we what we did with our free time, um, how we spent that free time and how we spent our money. Really love this picture of girls from the 1920s, young women, young women from the 1920s, um, especially if you compare it to photos um, a couple of decades earlier of women during the Victorian era. It was an era of really unprecedented freedoms for women. Uh, of course, 1920 suffrage, she gained, they gained the right to vote in August of that year. Millions of women were working outside of the home because of World War I. And so for the first time, they could really afford to participate on their own in the economy. There were some advances in birth control, um, diaphragms and things like that. So women could have uh, a great deal of fun without some of the ramifications and also advances and inventions and in things like the hair dryer, um, vacuum cleaners, washing machines. They meant that women weren't spending all of their time um, doing household work, that they actually had some free time. Um, and so they were able to explore that time. So this is a photo of the iconic flappers of the 1920s. Flappers were young women that were known for this energetic freedom. They embraced a lifestyle that was viewed by a lot of people at the time, certainly by their mothers, as outrageous, as immoral, um, as really just outright dangerous. And now we look back on them as sort of the first generation of independent American women. You know, flappers really pushed the boundaries um, in, in economic, political, and in sexual freedoms for women. Um, again, in stark contrast to the conservative uh, sensibilities of the Victorian era, Victorian era just prior. Um, even if you just think about the clothing that the two generations wore, um, even you know the undergarments that they wore. The Victorian era was all about um, corsets and these tight, heavy undergarments, um, very restricting. That was certainly not the case in the 1920s. If you look at these ladies, um, they're probably not wearing many undergarments, and uh, the dress dresses were loose, um, oftentimes they were short. So they really shocked people. Um, and I sort of compare this to um, the hippies in the 1960s and the way that they shocked the generation prior, shocked their parents and how they weren't accepted by their parents. I mentioned that the first commer commercial radio station hit the airwaves in 1920. Um, and just after that, just three years later, there were actually more than 500 stations in the nation, so radio exploded very quickly. Um, by the end of the 20s, there were radios in more than 12 million households. Uh, people also went to the movies for entertainment. So historians estimate that by the end of the 1920s, three quarters of the American population visited a movie theater every week. Of course, people were dancing. They loved to dance in the 1920s. They were going to you know, large jazz bars, um, jazz clubs, and uh, jazz music became very popular. Again, this idea of the rapid spread of um, popular culture happening in the 1920s. Mass media really allowed these dances and music that were popular, particularly in black culture at the time, to be shared with everyone. Um, so a lot of the things that were coming out of 
um, you know, Harlem and the Harlem Renaissance, those were shared widely and became extremely popular. Um, people were doing dances like the Charleston jazz bands that were led by uh, mostly black musicians like Louis Armstrong. They were playing at these dance halls, and that was what you heard um, in that in that time. Of course, a photo of Louis Armstrong and the popularity of jazz music. Uh, my background is really in architectural history, and so to me, there wasn't much that was designed um, architecture and otherwise in the 1920s that I don't find absolutely beautiful. A lot of those avant-garde social movements of the decade really influenced the art and design as well. Um, so the modernism movement and uh, a little bit later Art Deco styles really took hold. Um, it was the era of skyscrapers, the beginning of skyscrapers in New York and in Chicago, um, because new building technologies meant that we could build much taller and faster than we ever had before. And another photo here that's so iconic uh, of the 1920s, you know, we talked about the freedoms that women had for the first time. And what could be more illustrative of that than the fact that they cut off all their hair? Um, you know, in the Victorian era, they're tying back their hair in these tight updos. Um, in the 1920s, they cut it all off into these short bobs. And it was really a sign of that liberation. Just want to talk a little bit about prohibition and the effect that it had. Um, it's interesting to me because the 1920s and 1920 in particular ushered in this decade of um, unprecedented freedoms, but prohibition is this huge example of um, you know something that's really heavy-handed and restrictive and suppressive. Um, so to me, it's clearly reactionary um, to the time. The movement towards prohibition started much earlier. Prior to World War I, there was a really strong temperance movement uh, in many parts of the country, and that was led primarily by women. Um, and that's because women were the ones that were getting um, a raw deal because of alcohol. You know, it was seen, alcohol was seen as a destructive force in marriages and families. Um, men were uh, drinking their paychecks away. They weren't home to take care, help take care of children or children or um, or the house. And uh, also, you know, factory owners, employers were not particularly happy um, about uh, their employees drinking um, and drinking on the job or prior to coming to the job. Um, so the rise of Protestantism and the Anti-Saloon League which was a national movement that started in Ohio. And these factory owners all sort of voiced their support of prohibition at the same time. But it was really World War I that helped to turn the nation in favor of it. Um, in 1917, President Wilson had issued a temporary wartime prohibition, and that was to save grain uh, for food. And that year, Congress submitted the 18th Amendment, which would ban the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquor. Um, it is notable that it didn't ban it didn't, it didn't actually ban drinking alcohol. And it was at that time that many wealthy people really started to stock up uh, on alcohol. And so, you know, we still see um, in homes that were built in the early 1920s, will occasionally, e even locally in Finley, you'll find um, sort of these hidden um, compartments, um, not necessarily passageways, but um, hidden, uh, you know, closets and things in the house. Um, sometimes people ask us, not knowing necessarily the date of the homes, if these are evidence of the Underground Railroad. Um, you know, definitely not. Much too late for that. But um, most oftentimes they were probably in use during Prohibition uh, to hide alcohol. So the, the amendment was ratified on January 29, 1919, but it didn't go into effect until a year later. Uh, in 1920, at which time 33 states had actually already enacted their own prohibition legislation. Um, the Ohio legislature ratified the amendment in 1919. Many Ohioans uh, opposed it and filed a referendum seeking to overturn the legislature's action. And that referendum actually succeeded. Um, however, in 1920, the Supreme Court decided that the Ohio state legislator, legislator's original decision had to stand. Um, and it's interesting to note, I guess, that Hancock County throughout the state of Ohio, so, you know, our, our county here in Finley, um, was the eighth highest in votes supporting prohibition. 
So predominantly it was uh, the rural areas throughout the country and in the state of Ohio that supported prohibition and the more urban areas that um, really fought against it. And likewise, the degree of enforcement varied across the country. Um, it was generally enforced more strongly in rural areas and a little bit more loosely in urban areas. Um, some states just pretty much outright refused to enforce it at all, uh, states like Maryland. New York actually repealed their measures uh, by 1923. And in Ohio, though, it was pretty strongly enforced, and that was due in large part to the Krabby Act. Um, the Krabby Act was approved in 1921 here in Ohio, and it actually compensated mayors and judges in uh, law enforcement with additional money beyond their normal pay whenever they arrested, convicted, or fined violators of the 18th Amendment. So there was certainly incentive uh, to do so. Eventually, the Krabby Act was found to be unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, but while it was um, enacted, uh, it did cause prohibition to be enforced um, pretty stringently or pretty strongly here in, in the state of Ohio. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> drug stores were permitted to continue to sell alcohol as medicine. Um, so if you had a prescription, you could legally buy a pint of hard liquor every 10 days. And prescriptions were not especially difficult to get. You could get them for things like insomnia. Um, many speakeasies, speakeasies actually uh, operated under the guise of being pharmacies, and legitimate pharmacy chains at the time really flourished. So Walgreens, for example, uh, grew from 20 locations to more than 500 locations in the 1920s. Some small distilleries and breweries uh, continued to operate, um, you know, in, in secret, but the larger operations had to find new uses for their factories, and I find that really interesting. Anheuser-Busch uh, made ice cream during Prohibition, Coors made pottery and ceramics, um, but many breweries also sold malt syrup, which was sort of a loophole that they discovered. They could, you could easily make malt syrup into beer by just adding water and yeast, and winemakers had a similar loophole. They would sell these um, chunks of grape concentrate that they called wine bricks that were pretty easy for uh, home brewers and home enthusiasts to make wine out of. So this man kind of uh, epitomizes the negative consequences, mostly unintended negative cons consequences of prohibition. This is Al Capone and um, some other negative consequences of prohibition. A lot of people died because they were drinking um, illegal alcohol that was essentially toxic. So, you know, you hear the terms bathtub gin, rot gut moonshine, things that were produced by bootleggers. They probably killed more than 10,000 people um, before prohibition was repealed. And these really deadly mixtures, they contained industrial alcohol, which was used in fuels. Uh, the government added toxic chem, enforced that uh, toxic chemicals be added to this industrial alcohol, alcohol so that it could not be uh, made into liquor, but of course people still made it into liquor. And um, while it was intended to be undrinkable, uh, people were still drinking it, they were desperate, and it could literally make you go blind or kill you. Um, of course, another negative consequence, uh, there was a significant rise in organized crime. Al Capone was the most notorious example of this during the time. He made approximately $60 million a year from bootlegging and speakeasies, so incredibly prosperous for him. Um, prohibition is often called the noble experiment, and like any experiment, we ask ourselves the question, did it work? Um, drinking actually did decrease during prohibition. Uh, consumption fell by almost 70% during the early years of prohibition, and they remained, those rates of drinking um, remained about 30% lower than pre-prohibition years even several years after prohibition was repealed. The Great Depression is really what fueled um, calls for repeal. The potential tax revenue that the country could make uh, and municipality, municipalities and states could make off of alcohol was just far too great to ignore. Um, FDR called for repeal during his presidential campaign in 32, and it would happen just a year later when the 21st Amendment was ratified.
and supposedly FDR celebrated by drinking a dirty martini. Um, interesting to note that some t states uh, continue to maintain an alcohol ban after repeal. Kansas was dry until 1948, Oklahoma until 1959, and Mississippi was actually dry until 1966. So again, at the beginning of this, I briefly mentioned that um, being an era of great change and these new unprecedented freedoms came with a lot of pushback um, throughout the country, as just as change does now. Um, the Great Migration, which was uh, African Americans from the South moving to northern cities, and also the increasing popularity of black culture, um, again, widely dispersed through radio and jazz clubs, um, it caused this incredible resurgence of the KKK, uh, particularly in the Midwest and in Ohio. The Klan represented this return, you know, supposed return to values that were just being flouted by the city slickers and the flappers of the day. And so people flocked to their cause, um, grew absolutely huge in Ohio in the 1920s. There were somewhere between three and eight million people in the United States um, that were members of the Klan in 1920. And it is worth noting that in comparison, the entire state of Ohio had a population of fewer than six million in 1920. So the equivalent of the entire state of Ohio. Um, likewise, there was an anti-communist Red Scare in 1919 and 1920 that encouraged a really widespread nativist or anti-immigrant um, hysteria. And this led to the passage of an extremely restrictive immigration law known as the National Origins Act, uh, passed in 1924. And it set immigration quotas that included uh, people from Eastern Europe, excluded it excluded some people from Eastern Europe and Asia Asian nations in favor of people from Northern European nations um, and from Great Britain, as an example. Um, these conflicts and this change and the pushback against change are why some historians call the 1920s um, a, a cultural civil war. You had this conflict between city dwellers and small town residents, between Protestants and Catholics, between blacks and whites. Um, you had these new women and flappers um, against these advocates of old-fashioned family values. And I would think that this frame, this lens, is probably the most impo important part of the story of the 1920s, is that culture war that was happening. So we've talked a lot about uh, the context surrounding Finley in 1920, um, but I want to talk more about Finley specifically. And this is a photo of Main Street in Finley, Ohio in 1920. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Finley's history, we had a great boom in the late 1880s, a gas and oil boom um, that created great wealth and exponential growth in our community in a very short period of time. Um, but following that boom, by 1920, Finley's population growth had really sort of stalled. Uh, Finley had a population of about 17,000 in 1920, and that was about the same population that we had during the late 1880s. And the population would actually remain about that number until the 1940s. Uh, in 1920, houses in Finley were selling for between $1,200 and $3,000, except for some of those beautiful uh, Victorian era homes on South Main Street. Some of those were selling for upwards of $12,000. Uh, the south side of Finley, um, what we know and love as the south side of Finley, was just starting to be further developed. So in 1920, there were just eight families who had built homes on Glendale Avenue and seven families that had built homes on Green Lawn. And this is my neighborhood today. So, um, you know, we have, I live in a home that was built in the 1920s. Um, there was a lot of growth in that part of, of town in the uh, mid to late 1920s. But it's interesting to think about really none of that um, south side of Finley being developed at this time. So the 1920s were a time of change 
in Finley as well, but probably not um, quite as fast as the rest of the country. Uh, change came a little bit more slowly here. Um, some of the big changes in Finley in the early 1920s were related to the city's infrastructure, um, which was really being sort of burdened with the rapidly changing times. So we had, again, a lot of growth, um, exponential growth in the during the great boom years um, in the late 1800s. And we built a lot of infrastructure at that time. But by 1920, that was really sort of aging. Um, and so we had um, a lot of schools uh, that were built during this time. Uh, Donnell and Glenwood Junior High Schools were built um, in the early 1920s. And an addition was put on the high school, um, which at that time, which would later become Central Middle School, where I went to middle school, and of course now is the Marathon uh, Center for the Performing Arts. But you can see in this photo, this was the Central High School, the original building um, that stood where the auditorium is now for the Marathon Center for the Performing Arts. Um, so we spent, as a community, a lot of the decade updating the school system to be more modern um, and progressive. This is a really neat aerial shot of downtown Finley in the um, mid-1920s. Look at some of the beautiful buildings that had not been torn down yet at this time. Um, the old jail, the uh, first municipal building. Look at the beautiful um, fountain and courtyard in front of uh, the courthouse, which was built during the boom years. You can see at the top of this photo, um, those of you that are familiar with Finley's history, you'll see the central high school building, and then right next to it, a large addition that became what we all recognize as Central Middle School, a large addition to that high school that was put on um, in, the, in the very late 1920s. Of course, we had Finley College, uh, what would become the University of Finley, but Finley College at that time. This is a photo of the class of 1921. Um, in 1920, enrollment was probably somewhere around 500 students at Finley College. They had about 25 faculty members. And at the time, the college was under the direction of Reverend Geyer. Um, he was very well, re very well respected in the community um, and also really active in the community in a lot of uh, service organizations. Tuition was somewhere between $40 and $50 a semester. There's a pretty strong focus on religion. Of course, the University of Finley is still strongly affiliated uh, with the church, um, Church of God, uh, but religion was a, was a strong focus of the curriculum at the time. It was also a period of growth for the college. Uh, during the 1920s, they built a new gymnasium. Um, they added that iconic arch in front of the university and a lot more. Um, at this time, a lot of the expansion efforts at the college were heavily funded by the city and by local leaders. This is just a fun photo of uh, the Finley College basketball team in 1920. And I mentioned this when I gave the presentation at the Bourbon Affair, but um, I have this little game that I play when I look at photos from this era. I always try to pick out the person with the misshapen head. So um, I promise you that in each photo of a group from this era, you will find somebody with a misshapen head. So I'll let you <laughs> figure out who that might be in this photo, and I'll challenge you to look for that person in subsequent photos. Uh, another infrastructure concern in the 1920s here locally was our sewer system, or lack thereof. Um, it's been said that in 1920, the city had a pretty well-known sewage disposal problem. And it was so bad that the State Board of Health actually got involved and ordered the city to build a disposal plant. Um, but at the time, the city uh, requested several extensions, um, saying that they didn't have the funds to build one. Um, each one of these extensions was granted, and they didn't actually get the plant built and operating until 1933. So it was likely a very smelly decade uh, here in Finley. Um, one of the signs of change, I think, through the community in the 1920s was um, this focus on community development, not just business development, but community development. So in 1920, we had the establishment of the Finley Chamber of Commerce. 
So they are also celebrating 100 years this year. And the chamber's focus wasn't just on businesses, but it was more broadly on the community. Um, the chamber's first president was J.E. Bicknell, who was the president of the Electric Porcelain Products Company. And there were, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more here in a minute, but there was this group of um, civic leaders in this community in 1920 that did phenomenal a phenomenal amount of good. And I still think we're blessed with great leadership in this community. But um, to think about the power that this relatively small group of men held, these business owners and business leaders, and um, the respect they had for the community and the need they saw to share um, what they had and to take care of their own and take care of the community is um, just to be commended and uh, really interesting to look back on. By 1920, um, the Finley Country Club had already been in existence for more than 10 years, and there was really uh, a very prominent social elite in the community. And so the 1920s became the era of that um, of those wealthy and influential leaders um, coming together to form efforts and clubs to help the less fortunate. Um, it was an era of rallying resources within our community. And um, I think this was a sent sentiment that could be seen echoed throughout the nation. You know, um, a lot of service clubs celebrating uh, a century of, of existence right around 1920. And I assume that that probably um, had to do with the vast amount of wealth that the nation had. Um, again, for the first time ever, we had really sort of expendable wealth, um, but also probably the visibility of those less fortunate as well. Um, those needs became more visible to those that had, and so that divide of the have and have-nots um, probably became more prominent. In the year 1920 alone, Two of the largest and most active service clubs in our city, in Finley, uh, were formed um, in the same month, were chartered in the same month, in the month of March. Um, the Finley Rotary Club and Kiwanis Club of Finley, both chartered in March. Uh, also, the John Hancock Post of the American Legion, which is now known as the Ralph D. Cole Post, uh, was formed. Colonel Cole, who was a Finley native, was actually one of the 20 original founders of the American Legion, the whole national organization. Um, in their early years, the American Legion and Finley met in various locations, but they purchased their uh, current building on Front Street in 1926. And here is a photo of some of those community leaders um, who helped to charter the Kiwanis Club in Finley in front of the Elks uh, building right around 1920. That this photo is of the Rotary Ands um, doing one of their follies. Uh, they were known for um, putting on plays and pageants that they produced. Um, they were written by the Rotary Ands, produced and, and you know acted by the Rotary Ands. Um, and this is how they raised a lot of money for a lot of good in the community. Um, in 1987, the Rotary Ands were no more because Rotary uh, ultimately and finally opened their member opened its membership to women. Um, and today there are currently 49 female members of the Finley Rotary Club. Here's a great photo of uh, the Campfire Girls in Finley in the early 1920s. Some interesting um, business development that happened in the 1920s in Finley. Giant Tire Company moved to Finley in 1970, and I.J. Cooper joined the company in 1918. And finally, in 1919, the first Cooper tire was manufactured. So this is Mr. I.J. Cooper. Here again, a great photo of Cooper Tire in Finley in 1921. The Ohio Oil Company, um, which of course ultimately became Marathon, and today we are still the headquarters for Marathon Petroleum Corporation. The Ohio Oil Company um, had become an independent producing company 
separate from the Standard Oil Trust in 1911. Uh, and at this time, and until 1924, um, they were a crude oil uh, producer and transporter. But in 1924, they really made their first move towards becoming a fully integrated company, which meant that they had refining capabilities as well. And they did this by purchasing the Lincoln Oil Refining Company. Um, in the early 1920s, the company was still being led by J.C. Donnell. And this is a photo of all of the leadership of Ohio Oil Company in the early 20s standing in front of their offices. And this is Mr. J.C. Donnell. Um, I would have loved to have met this man. I'm sure he was an incredibly intimidating fi figure, even really just by looking at photos of him and um, hearing some of the stories about his leadership. I find him to be intimidating. He was a shrewd businessman, but he had such a heart uh, for the community and he really set the tone for community involvement and for community betterment for his company and for subsequent generations of uh, the Donnell family that would lead the company. Um, expansion is really what characterized his leadership at Ohio Oil Company. He died in 1927 and he was succeeded as president by his son, O.D. Donnell. Before J.C. died though, he uh, donated the land to build Donnell Junior High School Donnell Stadium and Donnell Pond, which are still, of course, important landmarks in our community. Um, and this was really just one example of his philanthropy in Finley. Um, as I mentioned, that community mindedness, that generosity was echoed by uh, the rest of the leadership at Ohio Oil Company. It continues to be e echoed by the, by the company, and it was certainly echoed by the next two generations of Donnell men uh, that would lead the company. And this is just such a great photo of J.C. Donnell, um, not one you've probably seen before. This is a photo that we found with assistance from a Marathon in their archives. And this is a photo of J.C. Um, doing some exploration along the Amazon. Um, he's actually sitting on a burrow on a um, steamship going down the Amazon. Um, and you can see that it says the Commodore in command. JC was known as the Commodore. Um, and I just, I love this photo. Some more great photos. Uh, the baseball teams from both Cooper Tire and Ohio Oil Company from the year 1920. Other large uh, employers and manufacturers um, in the community at the time included Buckeye Traction Ditcher Company, and this is a photo of their offices in 1920. Another major employer was the city itself. Um, I think you'll notice there are a lot of women in this photo. We talked about the fact that women were working outside of the home in large numbers uh, after World War I. They were making their own money. They were able to participate in the new economy uh, here in Finley. You'll also want to take note of misshapen heads in this photo. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the new economy and what people could buy in Finley uh, at that time. Great retail in downtown Finley in the 1920s. We had Bloomingdale's uh, here downtown. Here's a photo, interior photo of Bloomingdale. C.F. Jackson Department Store, which was on Sandusky Street at the corner of Sandusky and Main. Um, this is where the glass block building is located now, or what we might think of as Chase Bank um, on Main and, and Sandusky. This was a beautiful building and um, a fixture in the community for quite some time, Jackson Department Store. Again, talk about fixtures in the community. This is a photo of Patterson's Department Store, which was just across the street, again at the corner of Sandusky and Main. Um, Patterson's was in the community for generations, and so many of you may have memories of shopping at Patterson's, but this is a photo of the store exterior shot from uh, the mid-1920s. There were several generations of Patterson men um, that owned and operated um, the business. This is an interior shot of Patterson's. Another interior shot. Um, we had some great men's clothing stores in town. Interesting to note that a nice suit in the 1920s cost about 
another downtown retail establish establishment. This was Winders and Sons clothing store. And we talked about that new economy that emerged out of the car. Um, and that was the case here in Finley as well. This was a service station and an auto store at the corner, or excuse me, on North Main Street in Finley. Um, and again, this was new uh, to the landscape in the 1920s. So we've talked about what you could buy. Now let's talk a little bit about what you could do for fun in Finley in the 1920s. Excuse me. In 1907, um, a beach was built that was, it used sand from Lake Erie. It was about 400 feet long. Um, and this was the beach at Riverside Park. Uh, they also um, built the beach uh, around a reservoir. In 1910, um, they lit the beach with these lamps that you see in this uh, postcard so that you could swim at night. Um, and this was used, the beach was used until 1936 uh, when a swimming pool was built uh, at Riverside Park. But the beach had a boathouse. Um, there was a dam that was built there. The dam is underwater now. Um, but you could certainly swim for fun at Riverside Park. Of course, we also know about the sewage problem or sewage disposal problem that we had. So I guess you swam at your own risk. Uh, you could go fishing. Here are some boys uh, fishing at the dam at Riverside Park. Um, in the background, you see um, one of the ice houses. Uh, of course, ice was being harvested from the Blanchard River. Um, so that's what you see back there. We also had a great dance pavilion um, at Riverside Park. Originally, the first dance pavilion was built in 1907. Um, it was two stories tall. Uh, but in 1925, there was a, a local man named William Altmeyer who offered to build a dance hall on his land adjacent to Riverside Park. And he said he would turn it over to the city uh, for the right to operate um, the new dance hall. Um, and that became known as Green Mill Gardens, which again um, was around for generations. It cost about $20,000 to build um, in, in 1925, which is about six times what it cost to build the original dance hall uh, at Riverside Park. It had hardwood dance floors. Um, there, were seat there was seating along the walls. Um, something really interesting about Green Mill Gardens and I know people remember this as being a skating rink because it was later turned into a skating rink. But, and I don't know if this still existed uh, when it was a skating rink, but there were posts that were around the room that had the names of each of the surrounding towns in Hancock County uh, written on them. So you could congregate around the post with your hometown um, and hang out with, with people from your hometown. As I mentioned, it became a skating rink um, and that stayed open until 1978. You could also go to theaters. We had several great theaters in Finley in the 1920s. Here's a photo of the Majestic Theater. Um, this was actually a postcard from the early 1900s, but the Majestic was still in existence. This is the Royal Theater from the mid 1920s. And when you see photos like this, I just think it's almost hard to believe that this was Main Street in Finley. I would love to have um, this kind of a presence. We, I think we have a great downtown and, and a great Main Street, but it would be awesome to have um, at least one of these theaters still in existence downtown and to have um, this kind of presence downtown. Uh, certainly there were restaurants downtown and establishments that weren't identified as bars, but we might assume were still serving um, alcohol during Prohibition. There was the Brunswick. This is an interior shot of the Brunswick. It was located in the basement of what uh, I think of as being the Finders building um, downtown. Most recently, it was the um, Muddy River Bicycle uh, Company. Um, and the Brunswick had two entrances. There was one, one entrance on South Main and one on East Crawford with stairs that went you know, down into the basement. It operated as a business from 1911 until 1971. So again, one of these businesses um, or landmarks in town that um, was popular for generations and many generations have memories. The Brunswick served lunch. Uh, it was 
most popular during the day for local businessmen to go in and have their lunch and to play cards. At the Brunswick, the card game of choice was poker. Um, and the Brunswick would make a profit off of every hand of cards that you played. So they had a card playing area in the Brunswick, or the Brunny as people called it. Um, they had an area with a jukebox and a dance floor. There was a social drinking area, you know, post-prohibition, and a bar in the back. Um, many of the local bars did serve lunch, and that just, um, sometimes that lunch was really simple, you know, bologna and some rolls. Um, but in the 1930s and 40s, that was really popular because the bars, if they served a meal, they could call themselves a restaurant, and so they weren't taxed at the same rate uh, as just a, a drinking establishment. So if you did get in trouble in the 1920s, or you were caught uh, manufacturing or transporting alcohol, these were the guys that were going to get you. Uh, this was the Finley Police Department in 1924. Um, two new types of crime, this is interesting to think about, but the 1920s brought two new types of crime to Finley. Traffic crimes, which were not uh, a problem, you know, prior to the popularity of the car. And also, of course, crimes related to prohibition. Um, by the 1920s, horses were not totally eliminated from the city streets in Finley, but automobiles were becoming more abundant every year. And so there was really a control problem for local police. Um, by the mid-1920s, we had to have, you know, a traffic policeman with a hand signal uh, that would stand at busy intersections um, at certain times throughout the day. Um, and of course, that put quite a burden on a relatively small police force at the time. Fortunately, a couple of years later, the traffic light emerged, uh, but that wasn't until later in the 1920s. Well, I wanted to share with you this really cool story about um, the Queen of Finley's Underworld. <laughs> In, in the 1920s. Her name was um, Maria Smith, um, aka Lillian Gray, aka Dago Lil, which is what uh, folks in her scene called her, Dago Lil. Um, she was a Belgian immigrant. She operated a place called the Three Deuces, which was located on Crawford Street um, in what is now uh, the La Rich car lot parking lot. Um, and it's interesting to note, again, that East Crawford Street was really like the hotbed of illegal activity and ill repute in Finley. Of course, we have some great bars on East Crawford now, um, but during Prohibition and in the 1920s and prior to that, really during the gas and oil boom, um, East Crawford was um, the location of several uh, houses of ill repute. Um, a lot of prostitutes were uh, working on East Crawford. Um, Dago Lil was caught in the first liquor raid in the entire county in the year 1920. And she was later arrested uh, in 1921 for operating a brothel on East Crawford. She was sentenced to 60 days in jail and a $200 fine. Um, I love this description. When she was being booked, she refrained from cursing just long enough to puff on a cigarette. So she was quite a character. And we sort of followed her story through uh, the paper at the time. And when she was released from jail in 21, she was met at the gate uh, by her beau, Charlie Teal. And they immediately walked over to the courthouse where they were wed on the spot. So quite a love story of Dago Lil and her beau. So just briefly, I want to talk a little bit about prohibition um, in Finley, in our area, and its effects. Uh, we did have some bootleggers, and there was this mysterious Mr. X, who was a federal agent out of Toledo, um, that we uh, saw mentioned in several newspaper articles from the time. Um, I guess he helped to take down uh, some of the bootleggers that came through. Of course, Finley was located along the main route from Columbus to Detroit, and so there were a lot of people running um, through this area. And if you think about today and um, the ramifications of our location being right on 75, um, with, you know, drug trafficking and the opiate epidemic and how that's affected our area. In Detroit, uh, during the 1920s, alcohol was second only to the auto industry. 
in terms of its contribution to that um, local economy. So we did find several mentions of um, bootlegging in the area throughout the 1920s in the local paper. A couple of high-speed chases where shots were fired. Um, local police, Finley police, bought a machine gun in 1928 to assist with their increased uh, efforts to enforce prohibition. And while not in the 1920s, there are a couple stories of gangsters coming through uh, Finley and the surrounding area in the 1930s. In fact, there's a story of John Dillinger um, being in Finley in 1933, supposedly um, after he had been um, freed from jail by his gang um, in the early 30s. He was seen in a Finley barbershop. Um, he was identified uh, at the time he had requested a haircut and he was wearing a shirt, coat, and trousers that were stained in blood. So he certainly wasn't trying very hard <laughs> um, to keep himself uh, unnoticed, uh, though he did keep his head down and seemed in an awful hurry to leave, according to the paper. Um, there was also some manufacturing of liquor going on in the county and uh, some stills. Of course, a lot of the manufacturing um, happened outside of the city of Finley, outside of the city limits. Um, they needed more room for the stills to operate. So um, instances of this, when they're reported in the paper, usually happen out um, on farms out further out in the county. Um, one specific instance in 1929 where the sheriff and his deputies confiscated a 75-gallon still, 500 gallons of mash um, that were in 10 50-gallon barrels, um, and just really all the necessary equipment for a rather sizable operation. And I'm going to end with this infographic um, showing what was seized in our area uh, in during Prohibition. And you can see the vast majority of it was corn liquor, um, but there was a little bit of everything. And in total, there was over 4,500 gallons um, of illegal alcohol that was confiscated and poured down the drains by law enforcement um, during Prohibition here in Hancock County. Well, this is all I have for you tonight. Um, I really appreciate you uh, sitting through this program, and I hope that you learned a little something um, and that this was entertaining for you. Again, this is sort of the first time that we've uh, tried this with any of our programming, and given the current uh, state of things, I think we're going to be doing this a little bit more. And in that way, we'll continue to be able to share some great local history with you and, uh, and continue to share our story um, as a community. Uh, I wish you all good health during this time. Please stay safe and healthy. And we hope to welcome you all back to our museum, to the Hancock Historical Museum, in the very near future. Take care.